Hey there, Limit here. Welcome to another tech deep dive. I'll be going over some of the key technology and design choices for plugins, and I'll tell you some of the topics I learned that were super helpful and I would recommend to anybody who hasn't looked into it yet. This video is divided into chapters, so you can skip to the stuff that you actually want to see. But without further ado, let's get into the first thing on our agenda. And that's a little bit of housekeeping. Just in case you weren't aware, issues, contributions, all of that, I'm completely open to them for all of the projects that I have in my GitHub. I want all of you, if you find any issues, to file some tickets on GitHub. And also, feel free to contribute to the plugins. The plugins are fully open to contribution. As for the core JEI SIM project, I'm also open to bug fixes and other sorts of contributions of that sort. I want these plugins to be the most polished versions of themselves, and it's unlikely that I'll be going back to remake any videos on them. So for all those components that are already made, feel free to add any sorts of contributions to those. If you got some fixes that you want to contribute back to the project, feel free to make a PR and I'll come check it out. Some of the other stuff before we get into the main topics. These tech deep dives are meant to be more about JAI in itself and all the technology and decisions that went into making it. But there are always things that I learned from these projects that I kind of want to share with you guys, but I'm not the best person to really explain it. But others can explain it better than I can. And it's not really something that's specific to Project JAI SIN. So some of the things that you should probably check out are number one, for Python specifically, global interpreter locks and how to achieve true parallelism. This can also include stuff like general inter-process communication. The second thing that I would recommend you go and check out if you haven't already is in Python how asynchronous functions work under the hood. Not just how to await a function, how to do try accept, but really what is an asynchronous function and how does its implementation differ from a normal function. As well, why do we even use async IO? What is an event loop? all of that kind of information. The third thing, working with raw audio bytes. So how can you take a byte string and convert it back into playable audio? How can you play that audio? What is a sample rate? What is sample size? What are channels? What do any of those metrics mean? I, for quite a while, was quite intimidated by working with audio data and didn't really understand any of these terms. But the moment I did some reading and figured out how to make use of them, it really benefited me in optimizing how I process audio inside of all of these components. So the first thing that I want to talk about is why did I divide up JAI SIN? The points that I presented inside the main video mainly had to do with collaboration and try to make it so implementations don't clash each other when it comes to dependencies and all that. But let's go into those ideas a little bit closer. You might have heard of the architectures monolithic and microservices. Well, JAI SIN isn't exactly microservices, but it does follow a service-oriented architecture. What exactly is the difference between these two? Monolithic architectures are really everything being in the same project. Nothing runs in different processes or anything. Everything is part of the same project. There are some pros to this, but there are also a lot of cons. Some of the pros are that communication between different parts of the system are a lot simpler. Synchronization is a lot easier because you can manage everything on the same clock. And also deployments are much easier because it has a single entry point. But there are a lot of reasons why we don't use monolithic architecture for literally everything. The first is mainly scope creep. And what do I mean by scope creep? It just means that this project does way too many things and it's kind of hard to understand its role in everything. It's capable of doing some other things, but those things go unused, which is basically like unsloth inside of the original JEI sent to me. And so effectively, another way of looking at scope creep is being overqualified for the job. You're paying extra for the skills that go unused. Another con of using monolithic architecture is the size of the project, but also the maintainability of it. The larger the project gets, the more complicated the structure becomes and the bigger the project is, the more things you have to maintain and the more possibility of bugs to occur. Another thing is the hell that is dependency management. The more dependencies that you have, the more likely that you're going to have two dependencies that clash with each other in terms of wanting one specific version of something. One clear example that we have is with Unsloth. For some reason, Unsloth wants a specific version of Protobuf, but the gRPC protocol that I have makes use of another version. You can't really install both of these at the same time without there being conflicts. So you have to install Unsloth first, then you have to install the JAI and stuff separately. And the last point for monolithic architectures is vertical scaling. Vertical scaling effectively means hyper-investing into a single system, whereas horizontal scaling means you can divide the work amongst 
many systems. The problem with vertical scaling, especially when it comes to running AI models, is that you have very limited resources and adding more resources to a specific system becomes a lot harder the higher you go. And considering that this is a project that's meant to be runnable on consumer grade hardware, not even my 4070 is enough to run the RVC project while I'm streaming and have YouTube Studio and open and all of that stuff. I want to be able to move these models and distribute them across different systems. So we aren't bottlenecked by the number of PCIe slots or the number of GPUs we have in a single system. What about services? What exactly are services compared to monoliths? If monoliths are an army, that has everybody working together in the same team. Services are like breaking down that army into specialized teams and putting them in specific dedicated locations. And when it comes to the pros and cons of services versus monoliths, it'll be like polar opposites of each other. Services are much more coherent in their scope they're much smaller, they're much easier to maintain because their purpose is all the same. The dependencies don't clash with each other because they normally only implement one specific thing. And you can distribute them horizontally by putting one service on one machine, another service on another, and even run multiples of the same service on different machines. But it also has the opposite pitfalls from monoliths. Communication between services can introduce a lot of complexity, especially when you're trying to deal with synchronization. And you have to deploy a lot more things across a lot more different systems, which makes things a lot harder to manage and deploy. But in the long run, services are much better for maintainability and allow for a lot of contribution. You can have specialized teams of people working on a singular service as opposed to having one team work on every single service if it were a monolith. As long as you have an agreement as to how your different services communicate with each other, then teams only have to worry about their own service. So that's enough for why I divided up JAISEN into plugins. But let's talk about some of the technology that went into resolving the communication between plugins. So first of all, I want to introduce the importance of data streaming and events. Data streaming and events are a much more flexible way of communicating between services. It's like a very flexible conversation. As opposed to taking turns speaking one by one, I can say multiple lines before the person that I'm talking to can give their response possibly in multiple lines as well. Essentially, there is no necessity for order or even quantity in terms of the number of turns taken by each person and when. So in terms of AI models, this allows us to start shipping out a response while it's still being generated. And this can be very helpful as waiting for a response to fully generate can take quite a long time. Something like text to speech can take upwards to 10 seconds to fully complete. It starts generating the first bits of the response in like a second or so. And if you think about how we speak, whenever we're in a conversation, we can speak impromptu and keep coming up with the next thing to say while we're still saying the previous thing. And that's basically how this is working. It's kind of like YouTube videos when they buffer the video that they're going to play back. And usually when generation is fast enough, you can load up that buffer faster than you can play through it. And so this allows us to start responding within a second as opposed to 10 seconds. And it also allows us to start introducing real-time communication where events may not happen at a specific known time and applications just have to react to what's going on within JAISEN. So the first piece of technology that allows us to optimize communication between components is gRPC. The reason why I chose gRPC is because, well, first of all, it's actively maintained and an open source project by Google. Second of all, it supports data streaming both in and out. Thirdly, you can define a structured protocol, which allows you to reduce latency and put guarantees on the information that you're sending and receiving, which makes it great for collaboration. Not only that, but gRPC is usable inside of most popular programming languages. And if you want to make a plugin in a different programming language, I've also included the original protobuf files that you can use to compile into gRPC for your programming language. And then you can use that inside of your specified programming language in order to interface with JAISEN. Essentially, I see it as WebSockets, but more spontaneous and with more features. It's a little bit less flexible than WebSockets, but when it comes to components, I don't want that sort of flexibility in the interface because I want there to be expectations for the inputs and outputs. And with that expectation for inputs and outputs, it makes collaboration amongst developers a lot easier because people don't have to learn or assume things about other people's plugins. Not only that, but gRPC also uses HTTP2 as their protocol, which is newer and more compatible, but 
is also less supported because it is newer. So that's why gRPC is used in components where it makes sense for what's being developed there. However, it's not being used on the application sides because a lot of browsers don't yet support HTTP 2.0. Components, components, components. The hope with components was to make it feel just like you're implementing a class inside of the prototype. In fact, I'd even say that implementing a component is even easier than implementing a class within JAI Sin previously. This template project is effectively a normal project with a gRPC handler wrapped around it. So you don't have to worry about any sort of framework. All you have to worry about is writing the code that handles the bits of information that is given to you in pieces, but in the correct order and is only related to a single request. So you don't need to worry about reading sentences out of order. You don't need to worry about tracking and managing multiple requests. And you don't need to worry about how you communicate with Project JAI Sin. You just need to return and yield the right information. Where you start your implementation, there is one entry for each specific type of component you may want to create. You only need to implement one of these, and this should be the one that is according to the component that you're making. And this basically makes sure that you are getting the expected information and returning the information that JAI Sin wants. Windows and Unix machines have different kinds of scripts from each other, so there are two different starting scripts for each type of operating system. Developers can customize this script in order to customize the startup for their specific components, and JAI Sin will use these scripts in order to start up the application with a given port. Components, you can run them either on the same machine or on your own machine. And if you run them on their own without JAI Sin, you can reference them from JAI Sin by giving it the URL to that endpoint. However, JAI Sin can also run these components for you so you don't have to start every single one every single time. And basically how it does this is it searches for an open port, then it starts a new process which is running the CLI, it goes to that project directory and it runs the appropriate start script in order to start the project on it, that specified port that it found. Then it keeps track of where these components are running and every time a request comes in, it establishes a new gRPC connection and starts communicating with that component. I will make a video in a week or so that actually goes into how to make a component or application and dive deeper into that. That's kind of it for the architecture of a component. As for applications, because of the variety of applications that could be made for JAI Sin, I decided to keep this as simple as possible and use the tried and true REST API and WebSockets. This is basically how all websites function and all APIs function. Pretty much any programming language, any project is able to make requests to JAI Sin in order to run certain jobs or listen to events that are happening within JAI Sin. JAI Sin is basically a server in order to create responses. And so we have endpoints in order to manage custom contexts that are injected into the prompt, as well as endpoints for generating or canceling responses. These responses are communicated to all applications that are listening to JAI Sin's WebSocket server. And this makes it so any application can start a response, but regardless of which application started it, every single other application can listen to the response being generated. So this allows us to have something like the VTube Studio project react to the responses generated by JE Eisen, even though the VTube Studio plugins don't request for responses themselves. And this also allows us to hear something like donation messages from the Twitch plugins whenever those request for JE Eisen to thank subscribers or followers or something of that sort. So yeah, JE Eisen is basically just a service in this context and applications can do whatever they want and have no predefined roles like components do. But that's basically it for applications. Those are very simple. But what is happening inside of JAI Sin itself? So whenever you make a request for a response, we want to let the requester know as soon as possible that, hey, we got your request, we're going to start processing it now. And so in order to reduce that latency as much as possible, we just queue up the job and then return a result back to the requester. And this result is basically telling it, hey, we got your request. We're going to start processing it after we finish processing everything else. And the reason why we put this into a queue instead of running it in parallel immediately is because it makes managing responses on the application side much simpler when you know the order in which the responses were generated. So there may be a possibility where you have two lines come in from Discord, but JAI starts processing the second line, 
before it starts processing the first. There's no guarantee for which response I've started first compared to which one was requested first when those two requests are running in parallel. And so with this queue, we make sure that the first request that was made before we start processing the next one. When this queue starts to run, it has some several options that tell our response generating pipeline whether it should use the input as text or whether it should pass it through the speech to text component, whether the result of that should generate a response or not, whether we're trying to perform a special request or simply ask for a response to the current conversation, as well as whether it should generate a text output or also audio alongside that. Again, each of these stages will be streaming into one another, at least when it makes sense. And these streams are established by forming gRPC connections with the components that have been loaded into their own sub-processes. So essentially that's what went into making plugins for JE Eisen. Of course, there were a lot of troubles that I had, a lot of learning curves, a lot of wrong turns. I guess a key point to take away is that iteration is part of the development process. That's all that I really wanted to say for this video. Again, if you have any questions, you can ask me on Discord or put it in the comments down below. I still read all the comments, even if I don't respond to all of them. I try my best. But yeah, until next time, I think I've yapped for long enough. I'll get up and out of your way. Thanks for watching.